culture. So there is, uh, there are some cultural differences in terms of how perinatal mental health conditions look on the outside. So um, in some cultures, mental issues are more likely to be um, be presented as somatic problems. So um, people will experience mental struggle through their body and through like aches, pains, um, GI problems, like um, tummy upset, headaches, back pain, that kind of stuff. So we're probably missing a lot of um, a lot of pregnant and postpartum women who are experiencing perinatal mental health problems and they're being treated for physical problems. So that's another big issue. Another issue to receiving treatment is screening. So screening for perinatal mental health is very poor. Um, there's generally, you get screened um, depending on depending on your location, depending on your doctor, depending on your country, depending on your race, ethnicity, all of that kind of stuff. Generally, there are recommendations from the American, um, American College of ACOG, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Um, ACOG recommends screening throughout the pregnancy a couple of times, and then they also recommend screening post-delivery, um, usually around six weeks um, when a pregnant person or no longer pregnant person has their first follow-up doctor's appointment. So because there's, um, I mean, maybe being screened three times max and only one time postpartum, we're missing a lot of people who are struggling unnecessarily. So um, there has been some research on this. Um, there are, um, there's a study done by Weisner et al. This was from 2013. So it's a little bit dated at this point, but basically they were looking at every woman who came through a Pittsburgh women's hospital. So it was a very specific sample of women. It was over 10,000 women. And what they found was that 21, um, almost 22% of women experienced depression during that first year postpartum. But the interesting thing that they found in this study was that when they asked the women when they started noticing the depression symptoms, 26% um, of them noticed it before they were even pregnant. Um, so they kind of got missed that entire pregnancy um, at best. 33% of them noticed it during pregnancy. So that's when it started to show up. So all of those people were also missed. And 40% of those people noticed it post-pregnancy. So um, we're, we're missing a lot of people pre-pregnancy, during pregnancy, and post-pregnancy. Um, and of the 20, almost 22% of women who um, reported depression, almost 20% of them had suicidal ideation. So they had thoughts about harming themselves, which is huge. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later as well. So there's some, um, there's some research that says, and there's some um, recommendations that have been put forth that maybe we shouldn't be just relying on OBs to screen for peripartum mental health issues. And that especially in the postpartum period, um, pediatricians in theory should be kind of the first line um, where if you have ever had a baby or you've known somebody who's had a baby, maybe your parent has had a baby and you've been like old enough to kind of see what was going on. There are so many doctor's appointments, especially during that first year. Um, and so the idea is that uh, pediatricians should be screening for mental health conditions at each of those doctor's appointments for the baby, um, checking in on mom more than just how's the baby doing, um, and that we would probably get more accurate numbers in terms of what peripartum mental health looks like in our um, communities, and we would probably be better at um, providing treatment for these people. So, there are lots of problems with a lack of treatment. Um, there's a lot of cost to it. So um, there have been estimates that untreated perinatal mental health problems cost the United States about $14 billion a year. Um, and what we found is that um, this lack of treatment actually ends up leading to more expensive medical care because people aren't getting kind of the, the first treatment that would be helpful in the very beginning of them struggling. They end up not receiving treatment until they are really struggling and things are much more severe. So that causes more expensive um, medical care. There's also inappropriate medical care. So because we're not screening well for mental issues, 
A lot of people are being treated for physical problems that actually have a mental root and may be treated more effectively with a, um, a mental health um, perspective rather than just a medical somatic kind of perspective. There's also the unintended um, cost of increased child abuse and neglect when PMADs are not being treated. Um, discontinuation of breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is incredibly difficult. And if we're talking about strain on the mental well-being of the breastfeeding person, it's, it's a lot. So we'll actually see decreased rates in breastfeeding among people with perinatal mental health issues, which has long-term consequences both for mother and baby. And that is like a whole nother Psychology Day talk. Um, if you have questions about that, we can talk about it. Um, there's also research that shows that um, there's a significant impact on the brain development of babies when they are being raised by a person who has a perinatal mental health disorder. So we're talking about like these ripple effects of um, of difficulty because we are not good at spotting perinatal mental health issues and we're also not good at providing treatment. So, um, and that's not even all of them. This is such a bummer. The, uh, the outcomes are really, really bad when we're not finding things and not treating them. So those of y'all who thought one in five may have been a little lower than you expected, this might um, kind of lead us in the direction of maybe some of the stuff y'all were thinking. So overall, we're looking at one in five. When we start looking at specific groups of people though, we'll see significant differences in that number. So when we look at people living in poverty, 50% of them will experience a perinatal mental health condition. Um, this is huge. This is super depressing. Um, and I'm thinking, so those of y'all who are willing, um, what, when you think of somebody living in poverty, what other types of, um, what other types of things might be going on that could be causing difficulty for them in their life? Um, just essentials for the babies, um, diapers, food, things of that nature. Yeah, for sure. What else might be happening for people living in poverty? Lack of prenatal care, access to services. Um, a lot of the... Um, Collateral influences um, may be associated with uh, a partner or a lack thereof. Um, still thinking. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those ripple effect kinds of things when I'm thinking about it too. So if we're thinking about the the types of people in the data that we know who is the most likely to be a person living in poverty, um, especially in our area in Acadiana. The people who are most likely to be living in poverty are um, single women of color. Um, so you're looking at all of these other systemic barriers to them um, providing a life for themselves and for their children that has those positive outcomes that we're looking at. They're going to be working more. They're going to be homeless. They're going to struggle with daycare. Um, there's higher um, instances of substance use uh, in lower socioeconomic status mm -hmm. areas. It's just, go ahead, Dr. Lynn. Oh, um, I, I'm, I, I'm just, you know, I'm just really appreciating what um, you mentioned, all of you mentioned, those are really good points. I think the general picture is that the pregnant woman will be experiencing, especially from poverty backgrounds, they will, uh, they will be experiencing elevated levels of stress. And, you know, uh, of course, that has direct impact on their mental well-being and their physical well-being as well, and their baby's physical well-being and long, longer term mental well-being. And, you know, we know that the uh, release of stress hormones, um, that stress hormones could pass through the placenta and affect mm -hmm. the developing baby. And so if we're talking about HPA axis, hypothalamus, pituitary, uh, pituitary gland and adrenal gland, that very important uh, stress react, uh, reactivity, you know, stress reaction mechanism will be disrupted. And that HPA axis 
in the developing baby you know, is actually going to be disrupted from the very outset. So it's a very, very um, sad picture in general. It is. It's such a, I, I feel such a sense of urgency when I'm looking at this data and thinking, thinking especially about how difficult um, my pregnancies were with all of the privilege that I have and all the resources I have available to me. Um, yeah, and then when you start looking at the data on all of this stuff and its effect on pregnancy, labor, and delivery, and beyond, we also know that people who are living in poverty, people experiencing um, high stress, are also more likely to um, have preterm labor, which is a whole host of problems. They're more likely to need medical intervention during their labor and delivery, so they may end up with a C-section as opposed to a vaginal delivery, which then increases the amount of care and the amount of rest that um, and medical care that the birthing person is going to need. Um, it's just it's just a whole host of um, of problems. I'm going to check the chat real quick too, because I saw some stuff in here. Yeah. Baby expenses, transportation, shelter, support. Beautiful. Other untreated comorbid health conditions. Yeah, for sure. And then um, I think, I think this is coming. Let me see where we are. We're also going to talk about some other bummer stuff. So here we go. Some more bummers. Um, in case you don't know, the um, the trends in pregnancy related mortality. So um, this is pregnancy related death um, have been increasing. So we are on an uptick. We have been on an uptick for a while. Um, and also I feel like, man, this is such a bummer. Um, but we need to know it. Louisiana has one of the highest rates of uh, maternal and infant mortality. Um, in the United States, we are not the highest, but we are definitely up there. Um, and this is especially, um, especially focused, which is probably not going to surprise y'all, on certain communities. Um, so we're going to talk about that in a second. I've got that graph coming up. Other pregnancy-associated deaths um, are also really important for us to know, especially through the framework of perinatal mental health, accidental overdose, um, prim primarily looking at um, fentanyl-related overdose over the last several years, homicide is the number two. So um, a pregnant woman in Louisiana is more likely to be killed by a partner than to be killed any other way, um, which is really shocking. Um, suicide is the number three cause of death for pregnant people worldwide. Um, so there's a lot of mental health work that uh, we are not doing a very good job with. So not surprisingly, probably for most of y'all, the groups who are going to be experiencing the majority um, of the hardest stuff are going to be our communities of color. So um, non-Hispanic, Black, Indigenous populations, they're going to have higher rates of perinatal mental health problems, higher rates of medical issues, somatic problems related to pregnancy. Um, and generally, if we're thinking about, even if you think about Lafayette, those the parts of town that are primarily um, made up of people of color are also the parts of town that don't have access to the best medical care, the best grocery stores, not nearby anyway. So this is going to be definitely not just an individual problem, not just a family problem in terms of like genetics. And we're going to look at that in a second. This is also a systemic problem. Um, so this is this is all of our problem, whether or not we are the ones birthing these babies. This is another um, graph. So let me make, I'm going to try and make a little bit of sense to you. This is based on data from the UK. Um, I have the little citation up there for you citation nerds. Um, they were looking at um, psychiatric admission um, and specifically based on the point of pregnancy. So what you are seeing um, here, let me just check real quick. When I'm moving my mouse around, can y'all see my mouse wiggling? Yay. Okay. I'm going to make you go away then. So what you are seeing here, this right here is pre, um, pre, uh, 
pregnancy. Whew, I don't know why that word was hard. So if you look at pregnancy and up to pre fourth week, this is the fourth week prior to birth. So if you look at pregnancy, this is the rate of admissions, um, the number of people per week who were admitted at that point in their pregnancy. So all of these weeks then will be prior to pregnancy. And if you look at childbirth, this is the point of childbirth and the immediate aftermath of childbirth. Um, one week, two week, three weeks, four weeks. There's a huge spike in psychiatric admission basically from childbirth on. Um, that is, and it continues to be much higher than the average, especially during pregnancy. And generally it's higher than what you see going on pre-pregnancy. Um, we are missing so many women. We're losing so many women and birthing people, and probably we're losing a lot of babies because of these issues. So PMADS, um, perinatal um, mental health disorders, we're going to talk about the acronym and everything and the different disorders. Um, PMADS don't discriminate. There's not a group of people who is um, PMAD free um, or protected from the possibility of developing a PMAD. PMADS can affect anyone. Um, there's some really interesting research on um, several of these groups, not a lot of research, unfortunately. So if we're looking specifically at male partners, if we're looking at um, fathers, the research on fathers is also like kind of depressing and surprising to me. So we talked earlier, one in five birthing people are likely to experience a perinatal mental health disorder. One in 10 male partners, one in 10 fathers um, are likely to experience a mental health um, problem related to pregnancy and childbirth. There's also a lot of stigma for fathers. Um, it is difficult for fathers to, um, this is from the research, not just me. There's a stigma against admitting that um, you might not be doing very well, especially when um, your partner's pregnant. It's supposed to be a joyful time, especially when your partner gives birth. You're, you're a dad now. You've got to like be the rock and you've got to support your people. And like, you've got to be super pumped that you're a dad now. But it is hard and it's hard on our partners as well. So um, male partners, their symptoms tend to peak between three and six weeks um, postpartum. And then they kind of tend to settle. But if we're looking at the number of fathers who seek treatment, only about three, close to 4% of fathers will seek treatment for a perinatal mental health um, issue. So um, that's another huge group that we are definitely missing in this conversation. Honestly, the rest of these groups on here, single parents, LGBTQ parents, foster parents, adoptive parents, teen parents, they are definitely affected by perinatal mental health, but they have been so neglected in the research that this is a great area to do research in because there's so much to do um, and we know very little. What we do know is that single parents are definitely going to be more likely than non-single than partnered parents in um, developing a perinatal mental health problem, mostly because of the lack of the support. And then a lot of single parents are also um, living in poverty or at least not living on a two person income. Um, there's going to be additional issues there. LGBTQ parents, there's really very little research. There's some research coming out of the UK on specifically lesbian parents. Um, lesbian parents are a really fast growing population in obstetrics in the UK. And generally the UK and the US, our data tends to match pretty well in this area. So the odds are there's going to be um, a, a need for um, support for lesbian parents and all the other parents as well. There is very little research on um, bisexual parents when it comes to um, PMADS. The one thing that I think is interesting is um, bisexual women who give birth, if they are partnered with a man, they are more likely to experience perinatal mental health problems than if they are partnered with another woman. Um, so that research is really fascinating. Trans parents, very little research, um, definitely trans men, very little research, and trans women, there's also very little research on perinatal mental health, and it's going to be, um, it's going to be really helpful for us to have some good research on these groups. Um, generally, what we know from the research is that LGBTQ populations have um, higher incidences of mental health problems. So we could only assume that they're going to have higher rates in perinatal mental health um, conditions as well. 
foster parents, adoptive parents, even if you are not the one giving birth and experiencing all of those biological changes that go on with a pregnancy, there's still going to be a risk for perinatal mental health. Um, and I think there's a lot of shame that comes up for, for um, especially in the adoption communities, when you have this dream of what being a parent will be and what your child will be, and then maybe reality doesn't match that dream and all of the what ifs. Um, so there's a lot of shame in, um, in that for sure. And then teen parents, there's actually quite a bit of research. Teen parents have um, higher rates of perinatal mental health problems than do um, adults. So there's that money and socioeconomic money and socioeconomic mm, socioeconomic status. There we go. Are not um, protective. So uh, being in poverty, we talked about that's a huge contributor to perinatal mental health problems. However, some research, like it, some of it just came out looking at socioeconomic status and race. And the idea was when it comes to white mothers and black mothers, who is, who's most at risk of um, having a maternal mortality problem. Um, so what they found is that it is safer to give birth in the United States as a poor white woman than it is as a wealthy black woman. Um, even, even having wealth doesn't protect, um, our, our black and brown women from experiencing maternal mortality, infant mortality, or PMADS. So this is going to affect so many people and does affect so many people. There's lots of theories about etiology. So biological, um, I mean, there's all of this hormonal change that's going on through the entire process, getting pregnant, being pregnant, no longer being pregnant. There's some inherited vulnerability. Um, I mean, we, I think we all know in psychology that, you know, it's always nature, always nurture. It's probably a genetic piece um, of like making us more vulnerable to developing a perinatal issue. There's definitely psychological influences. Um, so like conceptualizations of what you think motherhood's going to be, what parenting is going to be like, um, dealing with changes to your body and self-image and all the things that you know about you. Perfectionism is a huge risk factor for perinatal mental health. Um, the way that people conceptualize their relationship to their own mother is another huge influence on the development of perinatal mental health disorders as well. And then social and environmental, institutional racism, structural racism, trauma, social support, all of that kind of stuff. So this is a multifaceted um, issue. And to me, that's good news because that means we've got lots of levels of influence in terms of what we can do as a community to help people, to help ourselves and to help the people around us. Myth busting, really quick. Um, when it comes to pregnancy, there are some myths that really contribute to like that psychological conception that can lead to perinatal mental health. Not all pregnancies are planned. So in fact, the research says that about 50% of pregnancies are unplanned. Sometimes unplanned means unwanted. Sometimes unplanned means wanted, um, but just unplanned. So that's a huge thing to kind of um, psychologically deal with, regardless of which direction. Getting pregnant is easy or getting pregnant is hard, depending on your um, ingrained beliefs about that. That can definitely affect things. Um, there's also these last ones. These ones to me are really hard. So the idea that pregnancy equals a live baby definitely doesn't work that simply. And that pregnancy equals a healthy baby um, definitely can contribute to our, um, our experience of the whole concept. Labor and delivery myths. Um, the whole, there's so many myths around natural birth versus medicated birth versus C-sections versus vaginal labor and what all of that stuff means. So there's a lot of research on um, birth trauma, like meeting criteria for PTSD. Um, and a lot of the research is showing that um, the, the plans that people have going into labor and delivery, when those plans don't work out, that loss of control um, is definitely a big piece of it, as is like a feeling of possibly being in danger of dying, which for a lot of people, when they are rushed to an emergency C-section, those kinds of things do tend to um, show up. So um, C-sections are definitely not the easy way out. They are major abdominal surgery. Um, and then I think another big myth, and I've seen this one in clinical practice and talking with the women that I talk with, the idea that like your baby comes out and you just automatically love it. 
um, and you think it's the most beautiful baby, like that's great if it happens, but there are a lot of people that when they meet their baby, they don't get those feelings. And that can be really, really distressing. So lots of myths and then myths about motherhood, tons of these as well, that um, being a mother is like instinctual that you'll just like know how to do it. Um, I mean, good for those people who do breastfeeding will come naturally. Um, I'll find time for me. My baby's going to sleep so much. All of that kind of stuff sets us up for, um, disappointment. So finally, the meat of it, let me pause real quick and see, um, if there are questions, checking the chat questions I can try and answer so far. I do have a, a quick question that I was going to save till the end, but since we stopped here, um, <laughs> I was really interested in the graph that you showed about uh, pregnancy related mortality and like across different uh, groups of people. Um, and it really struck me about the um, native Hawaiian and uh, other Pacific Islanders and that those numbers were so, so, so much higher. Um, do you have any ideas or have you read anything about why that group of people is specifically susceptible? I don't. That's probably the one group that I know the least about, which to me kind of points to probably why the number is so high would be my guess, is that I think the majority of us in the U.S. kind of, that's just such a neglected part of our community. Dr. Lynn, do you, I'm, I'm looking at you because I know you know stuff. Have, do you know why that number in particular might be higher? Uh, I don't know, uh, actually, but um, pretty much every time if you look at um, data sets, like really large data sets, this group of people will be, they, they show the smallest number. You know, usually sometimes researchers just had to say, okay, we just need to remove this group of people because usually they, they, there are very few people coming from this group to respond to any research studies. That's one thing. So you probably have a very small sample. And then if you happen to have some cases there, the percentage would tend to be high. That, that's probably the case there. Mm. So uh, we, the, you know, it, it has a lot to do with if we do population studies, you need to weight the samples. So whether the samples are really representing your population, that's a big question. And so, uh, you know, but then this results is coming from CDC. Basically, I, I think that's that's basically I, I they, they they I believe that they did they they did weight the samples. But um, it's just my my experience when we look at big data usually this is the you know usually this group has the smallest number of participants uh, compared to other groups and in case that you find some cases then the percentage would tend to be high that's just my uh, very preliminary um you know uh, uh, guess i am not quite sure i would think too um there's probably so i mean there are there are some of our brown people, so there's going to be some racial stuff in their medical care, which is a huge contributor to the mortality rates. There's also, I would, I would guess that, um, and BMI, BMI is problematic, but BMI tends to be a little higher in this in our black and brown communities. And then there, it makes me wonder too, because um, I'm thinking about Native Hawaiian, if if they are still on the islands. Um, access to medical care. If like prenatal care is probably difficult, probably expensive. Um, so those are some of the things that come to mind for me. But yeah, that's that poor group. Thank you. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm, I was just curious too at how they um, labeled those, the groups, uh, because I know specifically like in Filipino culture, there's kind of this you know, do we identify as Asian or as Pacific Islander? But when you put non-Hispanic Pacific Islander, then, but it's also non-Hispanic Asian, where do they, where do Filipinos fall? 
but yeah. that's just thank you I'll let you get back to it <laughs> so interesting there's so much I mean and there's so much room for research too that um yeah there's so much room so perinatal mental health conditions aka PMADs um PMAD is perinatal mood and anxiety disorders I Ten, PMAD is nice because it's just like easy to say. Um, it's much easier than perinatal mental health conditions. I, I think this is this is probably the autism, but I struggle with using PMAD as the um, umbrella for all of this stuff because I, I don't see psychosis as a mood disorder, but for the sake of PMADs, psychosis is going to come in here as well. So these are kind of our top four perinatal mental health conditions. There are definitely others um, I'm not going to talk about much today. So perinatal bipolar one and two, perinatal PTSD, and perinatal panic disorder. Um, these depression, anxiety, OCD, these are kind of the big ones. So perinatal depression is probably the one that most people are familiar with, postpartum depression. Only now we know that it can start pre-pregnancy, during pregnancy, and postpartum. So one of the big things to differentiate like right off the bat is the difference between pregnancy and PPD um, because postpartum depression can look very much like just how people become when they are pregnant and people who are pregnant sometimes look very depressed. So in pregnancy, you'll see um, a mood that's kind of liable, like people will become teary. Um, there's like there's an episode of The Office where Pam is just like continually watching a commercial about a dog not wanting to lose his bone and crying. Like everything is just like much more full of feelings. Um, Self-esteem tends to be pretty stable during um, pregnancy. Sleep is interrupted during pregnancy, but it's mostly because of like bodily function kind of stuff um, because of the pressure on the bladder. Generally women have to get up and pee several times a night. But the idea is that generally you can go back to sleep um, after you do that. So sleep is interrupted, but it's not the same thing as like an insomnia kind of issue. Generally um, no suicidal ideation with pregnancy. Definitely tired, rest helps, um, but tires more easily. Um, generally, there's feelings of like joy and anticipation, probably also some anxiety, um, but it's not all doom and gloom and worry. Um, and then appetite tends to be increased when people are pregnant. Maybe not in the first trimester, but in theory, the second and third trimester, appetite tends to increase. PPD, on the other hand, this is postpartum depression. So as far as our um, diagnostic system with the DSM, you would diagnose this as major depressive disorder, um, single episode, and then there's a specifier for, um, for perinatal kinds of um, or postpartum kinds of things. So PPD can look um, a little bit different than maybe like classic major depressive disorder. You'll see some of these similar um, behavioral and um, affective kind of symptoms but you will see some other stuff as well. Um, it's pretty common for perinatal depression to look, um, for people to look angry um, and like frustrated and to have a lot more negative feelings about the pregnancy than positive. There's also a difference between postpartum depression and the baby blues. So um, I've actually been really excited. So, I mean, I, I like to watch the Kardashians because I love their silly problems um, as compared to like my real person problems. One of um, the, no, she's not a Kardashian. She's a Jenner. What's her name? Oh, Kylie, 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 um, Kylie Jenner had a second baby and really struggled with baby blues um, and talked about it on, on their show. Um, and so I was really excited to see that. So baby blues happens to the majority of mothers. It's, it typically tends to show up pretty quickly after birth, um, peaks on day three and five, and usually resolves by the third week of postpartum. Um, women will be super weepy like crying for no reason, like all of a sudden just getting overwhelming feelings and crying. Um, baby blues is normal. Um, there's no suicidal ideation. There's no self-esteem stuff that's going to show up. There's no need to treat baby blues. They're normal and they typically resolve on their own. Research also does not show a link between baby blues and postpartum depression. So just because somebody has baby blues doesn't mean that they're more likely then to develop postpartum depression. This is just a, a relatively normal thing, probably based on the, the 
drastic hormonal changes that happen post-birth and as breast milk is coming in, um, moving from the colostrum, our first very small quantity, little breast milk that we have when babies are born to full breast milk, um, huge, huge hormonal changes. Um, yeah, this was just because you're my captive audience. Um, this was something that I found really interesting with my, with my own birth experience. So my first daughter, um, when I had her in the hospital, my husband couldn't stop crying. He would just look at her and cry and it was so cute. And, but I, I didn't, I was like, that's cute. Um, I mean, like, give me the baby, let me feed her. But then when we got home, like a couple of days later, that's when baby flus kicked in and he would like kind of laugh and poke at me a little bit because I'd look at her and just start crying. So, um, yeah, it's kind of shocking how it just like all of a sudden happens. So some of the ways that this will show up or can show up with our um, peripartum communities, feelings of overwhelm, like they can't cope, they're not going to be able to handle um, taking care of a baby, raising a child, feeling disconnected from the baby, like not really wanting to hold the baby or be, be near the baby. Maybe they might like feed the baby and then quickly hand the baby off, um, distressed when the baby is crying or like no re real feelings when the baby is crying. Um, kind of an inability to take care of themselves, let alone take care of a baby and any other family members. Um, anxiety, isolation, um, like I said, that agitation and irritability, and all the while feeling like this isn't me, like I don't know what this is, I don't know what's wrong. Um, people will also experience um, somatic symptoms like we talked about earlier, so they'll report headaches, back pain, um, tummy troubles, so all of this stuff is pretty common with perinatal depression. Um, this is probably the most common, most well-known um, peripartum issue. And um, uh, prevalence-wise, we're looking at about one in seven um, pregnant people will experience some of these types of issues. So perinatal anxiety is next. This is about 10% of our um, pregnant postpartum people. Um, excessive anxiety and worry. And usually the anxiety and the worry is focused on the baby, on parenting, on health. Um, like it's very pregnancy or baby focused. Difficulty controlling that worry. Again, agitation, irritability, like feeling on edge, having trouble sleeping, um, waking up a lot, checking to see if the baby is still breathing like excessively. Um, and again, increased somatic symptoms. So like feeling like your heart is racing, tension, tension headaches, um, gastrointestinal issues. Um, this can also, I mean, all of the perinatal disorders can affect um, breast milk production, which again, can kind of create a cyclical relationship between pregnancy and postpartum and um, perinatal mental health stuff where you start to stress, which means your breast milk production decreases, which means that you stress more, which decreases the breast milk production. And then you end up with a fussy baby, a crying mom, and it's like a whole thing. So perinatal anxiety, I think, um, is less well known. Um, it's important for people to recognize it. Perinatal OCD is probably what you think it is. So um, OCD is obsessions and or compulsions. Obsessive, obsessions are intrusive, impulse, impulsive thoughts, um, thoughts, images, that type of stuff. When it comes to perinatal OCD, most of the intrusive stuff is focused on the baby. So um, we'll talk about some of the most common um, obsessions, but um, the big one is worried about accidentally harming the baby. So being concerned that they will accidentally drop the baby or accidentally, um, there's, there's also a lot of distress with like thinking that maybe they will accidentally molest their baby. Um, it's definitely extreme concerns and the thoughts, all these intrusive thoughts are considered to be ego dystonic, which means that it's like, I'm not thinking it. The thoughts are just showing up. These, this is not me. Um, lots of what ifs, hypervigilance. So as, especially if they're worried about harm coming to the baby, they may not let anybody else hold the baby. Or if they're worried about them hold, harming the baby, they may refuse to hold the baby. It's hypervigilance um, and lots and lots of guilt. Um, they may also engage in behavior to avoid triggering that anxiety and those intrusive thoughts. So this is where the compulsions come in. Um, compulsion might be compulsively washing, compulsive checking, um, and we'll talk about some of the other ones. 
So this is this one actually is more common than I expected when I was learning about this stuff. So between three and five percent of um, pregnant and postpartum people will have some um, perinatal OCD. This number I think is also significantly lower um, because there's probably people who have OCD like stuff going on that maybe wouldn't meet full criteria for a diagnosis, but there's there's a flavor to it of what's going on. So these are this is a breakdown of the um, the biggest most common perinatal OCD issues that we'll see in um, in practice. The pie graph it goes from darker color to lighter color. So forty one percent is fear of deliberately harming the baby, like um, you know cooking, making a sandwich for your other kid, and you're holding a knife and you get an intrusive thought of what do I what if I stab my baby. Not that there's any risk that they actually will stab, stab their baby, but it's an extremely distressing thought to show up. 29% um, is going to be fears of contamination, um, intrusive thoughts about germs, which um, speaking of the pandemic, this is a difficult one um, to think about. So there was genuine risk during the pandemic. And I mean, technically now, I guess, of um, you know trying to avoid um, exposing new babies to COVID. So this is a little bit tricky to tease apart in terms of um, practice, at least for me, of trying to like recognize that like, yes, this is a scary time to, to have a baby and to be raising a baby, especially if you've got a medically fragile baby um, and teasing apart the stuff that's maybe more of the intrusive egotistonic kind of worries and concerns. 18% worries about accidentally harming the baby, um, compulsions of like ordering, arranging, um, lots of religious obsessions and compulsions. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more. Those ones, those ones are a little bit harder and lots of checking. So like compulsively checking the baby's breathing, compulsively checking to make sure the baby didn't put anything in their mouth, um, that kind of thing. So there's that. So the thing with OCD that is probably most important is that um, having a thought that you might do something is not the same thing as um, doing the thing. And this is, I think, like it's a simple but extremely powerful piece of treatment of that, like, just because you have this thought doesn't mean you're going to do it. Um, and that's where we get into perinatal, perinatal psychosis. So this is where there are delusional beliefs about self or about baby. These are um, egocentric experiences. So people do not see that they are intrusive thoughts. They genuinely believe. So we hear a lot about women thinking that their baby is possessed um, or that the world is out to get them and their babies. And so the baby would be safer if the baby was dead. Um, or needing to kill the baby, needing to kill themselves in order to save the baby from some kind of demon or harm or something. So perinatal psychosis is relatively rare. When it shows up, it is an, it is a, an emergency. Um, it is not, this is a rare issue. And even among the people who will experience perinatal psychosis, even fewer of them will be an actual risk to themselves or others. But because this is such a um, potentially harmful issue, people need treatment immediately. They need usually inpatient medication. Um, this, is, this is a medical emergency. So this is probably the one that people talk about and know about most from, from the, the media. Um, these are the stories that come out because they're just so shocking and sad and terrible. Um, and there's there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of research on this um, for people headed into different career paths, lawyers, mental health people, um, that is really, really important. There's a video from Postpartum Support International, but I don't think we have time for it. So um, Postpartum Support International is a resource that they have tons and tons of like articles, support groups, videos, um, PS, um, PSAs about all of these types of issues, communities, and they're also the governing body of who earns the perinatal mental health specialization um, certificate. So no, wait, this video, um, highly recommend if you go to their social media or to their website, because it's um, men who were partners of somebody who ended up developing um, 
peripartum psychosis. And they talk about the experience of watching their partner kind of like disappear um, into that disorder. Treatment, therapy, and medication. We talked about this. Um, in terms of treatment, I highly recommend, recommend finding a clinician that has the PMHC certification from PSI. Um, PSI has a database on their website where you can look up clinicians in your area who have earned that certification, that, which means that they've gone through the extensive training. They've done, um, I think it's two years of practice in working with mothers um, and around the perinatal time period and passing a standardized test um, and keeping up with regular continuing education as long as they have their license. So PSI vets all of the people who claim to be experts in this area. When it comes to medication, um, there are medications for every issue that are safe during pregnancy and are safe during breastfeeding. So there is something that is safe. The thing to balance is even if this is not the safest recommendation, is it better to expose a baby to this medication that might not be the safest, or is it better to expose a baby to a mother who's not her most well? Um, and so there's a lot of research on kind of like weighing these pros and cons. And this honestly is why it's hard to find practitioners who feel comfortable diagnosing. In our community in Lafayette, we actually do have practitioners who, who know the stuff and are willing to work with these populations. So we're, we're pretty lucky. A whole bunch of references. So that is perinatal mental health. Um, with the time we have left, I would love to answer any questions you might have. Oh, oh go ahead. Oh. Well, I, I was going to go really uh, broad, sort of in the spirit of some of the questions that students had for other speakers earlier in the day, which which is kind of curious about you, mm. so the, this kind of work, you know, uh, um, uh, did you, did you, when you were first getting, um, getting into the fields of psychology and counseling, um, did you envision that you would be doing this kind of work with, uh, around pregnancy? Had it, has it been sort of a passion for you for years, or is it something that you discovered along the way? And how did that happen? So I think parenting has all, well, parent, helping children has always been the thing. Um, and then when I actually started getting into working with kids specifically, I found out that like, there's only so much you can do because the kids just go home to mom and dad or whoever's raising them. And so to me, it made sense then to focus on parents because they're the ones with the power. Um, so that's how I ended up into parenting. Honestly, um, probably before I started working with the women in the jail, I hadn't really considered pregnancy um, at all, but then seeing the things that they went through and how difficult their situations were, and then on top of that, becoming a mother myself really kind of uh, lit the fire for perinatal mental health. But um, it's always it's always been about kids and parents, so that's a little bit of, of how I ended up here. Thank you. I think I think that for hopefully you know, some of the students who are here or who come back and look at this recording, I have a feeling that a lot of them get curious about that. <laughs> Erica, you had something? Yes. Well, first, I want to say thank you for such a great presentation. I feel like I learned a lot um, and I'm really, really thankful for it. Uh, so I guess my question right now is what are some ways or what are the best ways? Sorry, Karen was bothering me. So um, but <laughs> um, what are some ways to help a pregnant person or some within that that perinatal time frame um, when you're a partner or a friend or a colleague, even if you seem to notice that things are a little off? I think, I mean, one thing, so many things. One thing, first thing is um, not being afraid to say like, hey, I've noticed this, like, tell me about it, what's going on and like checking in, but being very upfront about like, hey, I've noticed this particular thing. Um, I've noticed this change. I've noticed that you're more quiet. I noticed that like, you seem stressed, like, tell me about how you're doing. Um, and then also like for everybody, just 
checking in with pregnant people and postpartum people about more than just like how's the baby um and I think probably mostly because of my experience of being pregnant the first time um not assuming that pregnancy is good um assuming that like we don't we don't know how people feel about being pregnant so not like when someone discloses pregnancy or you suspect pregnancy not coming to them immediately with like tell me all the exciting things like asking them like how are you feeling about it because they might uh feel comfortable enough then to say like this sucks um this is terrible um and that's super super meaningful third last thing is even during pregnancy postpartum like don't forget that they are more than just pregnancy um that was something that was difficult and I think is difficult for a lot of people in terms of like identity we have a lot more going on than just what's happening in our uterus so um not forgetting to ask people about like all the other things that they have going on and what they care about I hope that's helpful in some way absolutely thank you other questions Um, if I can chime in a little bit, um, because um, recall that we uh, actually talked about a lot of factors that would affect you know, perinatal uh, mental health of a woman. And um, so from the healthcare perspective, we need a teamwork. Um, we, we need mental health professionals. We need people who can, like case managers, who come in to address the financial issues um, and you know relationship issues and uh, and, and medical professionals, of course. Um, the, if I can come, if we come from the perspective of so-called infant mental health, starting from conception to the age of five, right? If we're looking at the well-being of the baby, it's closely tied to the parents and the people surrounding the infant. And, uh, you know, actually the state, um, the state government is going to resume the service of early childhood support services in Lafayette. It was cut, uh, the program was cut due to the budget because the, because of the, you know, financial storm uh, in, 2007 and eight, um, so it, the program was cut. But then uh, they're they're trying to put it back, um, and so this is going to be a multi um, you know is a teamwork uh, addressing multifaceted uh, issues surrounding the woman and the infant as well. So. Um, I echo Erica's uh, comment. I really, really appreciate your talk. And we I think you're so smart <laughs> addressing so, such a complex issue in such a short time frame. And, and I am just very, very impressed. And I am so excited that we have another person uh, in the department, you know, looking at the infancy issues. <laughs> so I am very, very excited. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was thinking as you were talking um, in terms of like our area, um, the the team effort that it's going to take to help people. We've got the um, nurse family partnership, which is so good, where the nurses will come into the home and help parents through pregnancy and postpartum, I think at least for a time. Um, Healthy Start, they've got case managers and our, our Healthy Start is like they're so amazing. All the Healthy Start case managers are lactation consultants, um, car seat technicians, like they do so much and they go in home. They also, uh, the case managers don't, but there's also mental health um, services provided through Healthy Start. And the girl who does it, she's also a PMHC. So she's she's got that training and that passion. Um, and then I was thinking too about like all the legislation, um, all the room that we still have. So I read, this is also really useful. Um, I read a study in preparing for this too, that um, the 15% of people getting treatment, that number drastically improves if, um, if there is a provider in the same office as the medical. So like I, our OB offices, 
need mental health people in the office to provide those services because that's how we get that 15% to go higher. When OBs just refer, um, it's very unlikely that people won't seek that treatment. So crazy. We see Victor. What kinds of things locally would help outcomes improve? More training, more awareness. I mean, training and awareness for sure, but oh, I don't even, oh. honestly, it's probably not the kind of answer that you're looking for, but um, I am such a big believer in the Healthy Start program. So legislation, that money is, um, that money comes from the federal government. And so our, all of our lovely people, um, Higgins and Kennedy and Cassidy and all of them, they are the ones that make sure that we get the money that we need. So um, everybody needs to know about peri perinatal mental health issues and all the ways that we already have to impact those issues so that we can do, we can keep doing it and we can do it bigger and better. So the work the work that I've been able to do with our pregnant people in the jail is all coming from Healthy Start as well. So um, yeah, finding the people who are doing it and bulking them up as opposed to try and reinvent the wheel, I think is something I struggle with, but it's very important. Hopefully that's helpful a little bit, Victor. Any other questions or comments? Very informative. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I, I echo like uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Lynn's comment about her, and given that we have played at least a small role in in your your training background, I'm willing to take all of the credit. I will allow it. <laughs> Just kidding, y'all. Thank y'all so much. This was this was a pleasure. Yes, thank you. And thank you to everyone uh, for joining us on Psychology Day. I hope that y'all learned a lot uh, and that maybe it's piqued your interest and your curiosity into new career avenues or research possibilities. Um, and hopefully we'll see you next year at the next Psychology Day. <laughs>